Okay, thank you. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit from supersymmetry and talk about something else. But you'll see that it actually does involve some elements which are in common with my discussion of Kähler Dirac fermions earlier. Um, so I'm trying, the goal today is to describe a continuum theory of strongly interacting fermions, which has a sort of unusual um, and interesting phase structure. So for a start, as I take some coupling to infinity and some strong coupling limit, the vacuum is dominated by a four fermion condensate. That condensate is symmetric under all the symmetries of the theory. So it breaks no symmetries whatsoever. Nevertheless, if you compute the spectrum of the fermions, if you look at the fermion mass, it, it's, uh, it's non-zero in that phase. So that is a sort of, a, a sort of a, an unusual situation. Most of you associate fermion masses with symmetry breaking when, and usually with the formation of bilinear condensates. So this is a model which apparently does not do that. Um, in fact, I'm going to argue that this sort of uh, massive phase, massive symmetric phase, is separated from the a massless phase uh, by one or more phase transitions. And I'll tell you a little bit about those, the nature of those phase transitions as, as we go along. Um, okay. So, uh, specifically, one of the transitions we're going to interpret as due to a condensation of topological defects. Those topological defects uh, will be associated with an auxiliary field that you used to introduce the four fermion interaction in the usual way, the way that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So one of the motivations for the model I'm talking about is that when you discretize it in a straightforward manner, you arrive at a certain staggered fermion model, actually a model of reduced staggered fermions, uh, which has been uh, analyzed in recent years by several groups, uh, both in the condensed matter and particle physics literature. And so some of what I'll say is meant to give an interpretation of those uh, numerical results. So, so let me start off by actually motivating the continuum calculation by, by going through that, uh, some of the, those sorts of results. So it's a, it's a model built with staggered fermions, as I said. You will have four reduced staggered fermions. So a reduced staggered fermion, there's a single grass burn at each lattice site, at each point in the lattice. So once you have a, that situation, there's a unique four fermion interaction you write down by taking products of those reduced staggered fields at that site with some coupling constant, right? So this model was introduced by Shailesh a number of years ago in a context of three dimensions, but it can be lifted easily into four dimensions, and that's where I'll concentrate in this talk. So it's a very interesting model in three dimensions. It's been studied very hard uh, numerically, and there are many sort of proposals for interpreting the three-dimensional theory, but I'm just going to concentrate on four dimensions because four dimensions is presumably of more interest to a particle physics audience. So this is, this is numerical data obtained with David Shake, wherever he is. Um, so th this is just meant to motivate you for the rest of the talk. So here is a, a picture of basically the four fermion condensate as a function of G. So you see it evolves smoothly from small values up to some saturated values up here. This is actually strictly a rescaled version of the four fermion condensate, but it's good enough for the purposes. So you see a nice smooth sort of S-bend shape for this four fermion condensate. The structure of this, of course, makes you think about phase transitions. And so you can construct a susceptibility, which is basically the integral of a four-point function built out of the fermions. Um, and and you, what you see, indeed, is a, is a nice growing peak. It grows with the volume in the vicinity of G, of, in this case, of about 1. All right. okay, so, that's the, so here's the four fermion condensate. There is some, apparently a, at least one phase transition somewhere between the two regions. So this is the massless phase, where as I switch off G, um, I expect, or I take G small enough, I expect a, um, because this is an irrelevant operator in four dimensions, I expect I flow to a massless phase, a weak coupling. And as I take G very large, the region up here, uh, this is the region dominated by a symmetric four fermion condensate. And those have been measured numerically, and you can see it. Right. So this is well understood. You can, in fact, reveal in the, stag in, the in the staggered fermion model, you can do strong coupling expansions, and you explicitly see that there's a, a four fermion condensate dominating that strong coupling. And you can even pull out the fermion mass in that strong coupling limit. So you know that phase exists uh, without even doing Monte Carlo. And you also know this massless phase has to be there because the four Fermi term has to be irrelevant for weak coupling, at least. The interesting thing is in both cases, of course, the bilin and some sort of bilinear of the fermions vanishes. So this is not a transition. If there's a single transition here, it's not between massless to massive phase or symmetric to non-symmetric phase which would be the conventional sort of NJL type scenario, it's been two, two, between two map symmetric phases. 
Okay. So in fact, actually, the numerical, I won't have time to discuss the numerics here, and it's not my focus, but in fact, we now believe there is more than one transition in this region. The peaks are so close together that it's actually hard to disentangle them. It looks like a single peak, and I was certainly personally confused by that for at least a year. It looks like now the, the, the numerical data favors actually uh, uh, two transitions in this region. But anyway, the, nevertheless, these statements are still true. So, um, so the question is, is this massive symmetric phase a lattice artifact? So if it is, it's not terribly interesting. Is it bordered by first order phase transitions correspondingly? So if it's, if it's separated from the continuum region by a first order phase transition, it's certainly a lattice artifact and you're not really interested in it from the point of view of continuum field theory. I just hinted at the fact there may be two transitions here corresponding to the presence of an intermediate phase which turns out to have broken symmetry. So we'll see that's an option in, the, in our continuum model too. So that would be the standard NJL scenario. In fact, that kind of, that kind of scenario has been seen in many lattice four fermion models going back many decades. All right. So we'll see that indeed that, that is a possibility in this model too. But if there are these transitions separating that, these uh, intermediate phase from, say, the strong coupling phase, what's the nature of the phase transition connecting them? If it's continuous, what on earth is the continuum theory that lies there? Okay, so there are various open questions here. So in this talk, I'm going to construct a continuum theory which corresponds to this lattice model, as you'll see. And I'll show how you can interpret the four fermion uh, condensate in terms of the condensation of topological defects in that theory. Um, and it will even allow you to understand the presence of a fermion mass, non-zero uh, uh, non fermion mass at strong coupling. Well, furthermore, and this is a bit more conjectural, a bit more speculative, I'm going to argue it's possible to modify this four Fermi theory in a specific way so that we remove this intermediate broken phase that we think is, is there. The broken phase is extremely narrow, and there's an argument as to how you might remove it completely. In that case, you're really morphing from two symmetric, from a massless symmetric phase to a massive symmetric phase through, I'm going to argue, a continuous phase transition, which is an analog of what you see in two dimensions with the XY model. So it's a B, I'm going to argue it's a BKT-like phase transition separating these two phases. That implies, of course, a new conformal field theory in four dimensions for strongly interacting fermions. So it's a very uh, strong result if it was true. So you can, you can see for yourself how it goes whether you believe that. So I'm going to start from four Majorana spinners in the continuum. All right? And I'm going to, again, assume that there's a global symmetry, which is a product of the Lorentz symmetry, I'm in the Euclidean space, times the flavor symmetry, which is going to be SO4 because it's Majorana spinners. And I'm going to play my game that I played for supersymmetry. I'm going to argue that, I'm going to, that I can decompose this action under the diagonal subgroup D, the twisted Lorentz symmetry, under which these two transformations are taken equal. So the Lorentz rotations are set equal to the flavor rotations, which promotes this uh, Majorana spinner, set of, Majorana, set of Majorana spinners, into a four by four matrix. And I can trivially rewrite the action as a trace of those of psi d slash psi. Right, so that's, that's my starting point. I'm gonna look at a single Kähler Dirac fermion. All right, but I can take four copies of that if I want and just add them together. And, and put in an explicit SO4 invariant interaction, four Fermi interaction, which couples these Kähler Dirac fields. Right? So I can take the trace of psi A, psi B, couple it to the trace of psi C, psi D with an epsilon symbol. All right? So this is explicitly. Now, so the, the key thing to realize now is that while this rewriting of the action was a sort of trivial thing to do initially, in other words, the theory always has the original symmetry SO4 cross SO4. And this rewriting of it simply focuses in our diagonal subgroup. Once I introduce this interaction term, that is no longer true. This interaction term is only invariant under the diagonal subgroup. So I'm forcing a twisted Lorentz symmetry in through the strong core Fermi interaction. Right? So the interaction breaks the global symmetry explicitly down to the diagonal subgroup to the twisted Lorentz symmetry we've used in our discussions of lattice supersymmetry. And furthermore, this additional SO4 symmetry I put in, this ex sort of additional external symmetry, prevents uh, bilinear mass terms from being induced in the effective action. Right? So I have a symmetry which simply I can't write down any invariant bilinears anymore. Right? So that's just the, the starting point of the discussion. To, make, to, to connect to that staggered fermion model I talked about at the beginning, I can imagine introducing a lattice by simply expanding these matrices 
essentially on sort of products of gamma matrices which are indexed by position in a lattice, a hypercubic lattice. All right, so I can use, so I can introduce these guys this way. So I'm basically assigning the 16 components of this continuum fermion for my run of fermions to the unit hypercube of the lattice. So this is actually a rather standard way to map uh, uh, these Kaled rack like fields onto reduced staggered fermions. So it parallels the discussion I said before when I said that Kaled rack fields can be thought of as reduced stagger, as staggered fermions. All right, so this is explicitly how you do it. You make this substitution with an x-dependent product of gamma matrices here. You throw it into the continuum action. You replace continuum derivatives by symmetric difference operators, and you do the traces, this, this trace back here, all right, and this one here, these guys. So you just do those traces, all right? What you will find, and I don't have time to do it here, is exactly that staggered four fermion model I just described. So I can think of that staggered fermion model as arising from this theory written in terms of coupled Kähler Dirac fields in the continuum. All right, so that's the motivation back again. Let's go back to the continuum model. Of course, to do anything with this in the conventional way, I need to replace the four fermion interaction with some sort of Yukawa coupling, right, and integrate over the corresponding auxiliary field. So this is the interaction I need. I need to couple a bilinear in psi to some sort of auxiliary field uh, and with a quadratic action for the auxiliary. So this sigma plus here that I'm using in the auxiliary field has this interesting structure. It's self-dual. So sigma itself would be an anti-symmetric 4x4 matrix, so it has six real components. Actually, it satisfies a self-duality condition, so it actually only contains three independent real fields. Right? In fact, it transforms in the adjoint representation of an SU2, which is built which is part of the original SO4 symmetry. So this is the symmetry I imposed externally. It can always be written as two SU2s. And actually, I can reproduce the structure of the four Fermi term I need from just a field which transforms only under one of those SU2s. So perhaps it, it, it's, it might be useful to, to uh, see exactly how that works. Um, so I have to produce a term which looks like trace, say, psi 1, psi 2, trace, psi 3, psi 4. That's essentially my four Fermi term. And I can get that, of course, by squaring trace, psi 1, psi 2, plus trace, psi 3, psi 4, like that, because the, only the cross term contributes because these are Grassmann variables. And so you sort of automatically see the emergence of a sort of self-dual object. And so since there's a, this sigma here, up here, uh, is in, there's a, you can write sigma as basically a projector on, sigma plus is a projector on sigma, so I can in, take the projector and move it around, I can put the projector on sigma or on the size or whatever I want. So the whole point is I can generate this four Fermi term I wanted by coupling a bilinear and, and these Kähler Dirac fields to um, this object transforming the adjoint representation of one of the SU2s, part of the original SO4 symmetry. All right. That's actually important from the point of viewing, in the end, things like numerical simulations, because when I integrate the fermions, I get some sort of Fafian. But because this, the fermion operator is invariant under the other SU2, every eigenvalue is doubly degenerate. So that allows you to show the Fafian is actually real positive definite. So if you need to do simulations, for example, in staggered fermions, the same property holds. Um, this, doesn't, this is exactly the same story for the staggered fermion as well. There's no sign problem here. It also allows me to write down an effective action, which is nice and real, by just taking essentially uh, this operator, the Fermi operator, times its dagger, and squaring it, and dividing by a factor of two. So I can write an effective action for sigma plus, which involves the original bare term up here, plus a trace log term, the usual trace log term you would encounter from expanding sort of mm dagger if m is the Fermi operator. So I've been careful to include derivative terms in here. So in principle, I get some terms which depend on sigma squared and the derivative, but also there are terms which involve d slash on sigma plus. Right? So there's a cross term that arises too. So this is just a standard representation of the Fafian now. <clears throat> and what, so if I look at constant field configuration, so let me just drop the derivative on sigma for a second. This term here is of symmetry breaking form. This will generate, when I start expanding out in powers of g squared, it generates a symmetry breaking potential. All right? No great surprise. So I expect as I increase the four Fermi coupling G above some critical GC, the symmetry will break. 
In fact, this SU2 will break down to a U1. Because basically, I have to pick a VEV for one of the sigmas. There's three sigmas in the edge of representation, polarizing in one direction, did you, you want for this auxiliary field. So you expect, if I crank up the coupling, there will be a, you will enter a symmetry broken phase uh, with a residual symmetry you want. Right? In fact, you can rewrite, you can reparameterize this theory in terms of, uh, if you want Pauli matrices, tau, by just writing sigma as some non-zero constant in the broken phase times n dot tau with n squared as one. So it's like the O3 sigma model. So the vacuum manifold of the theory is S2. Right? So the natural symmetry breaking pattern of this theory is breaking to S2 right? from, it, from the original SU2 group, right? so S3. <clears throat> so let's go a little bit further. So that's just an analysis of what, what, what would do for a constant breaking field. Right? Suppose all the sigmas point in a given direction. So of course, I'm going to argue that the situation is more complicated potentially than that. And I can look at the structure of the general effective action for sigma by expanding out and including the terms now or corresponding to basically g d slash sigma plus. So I can start doing a derivative or a large mass expansion on this, term, on this uh, uh, log. Right? And so what do I get? Well, it's sort of easy to see. I have to do this trace here. And I'm going to basically drop the leading term here. So this is basically a term involving g squared sigma squared and g d slash sigma. And I'm going to expand it in powers of basically 1 over g, or 1 over the mass. Right. So I can introduce a mass parameter, which is g times, sig, g times mu. And the only terms that will survive when I do the trace will be I have to get rid of all the gamma matrices sitting inside of here. And also, sigma contains these Pauli matrices. So I'm going to trace over group indices and Lorentz indices, and look what I get left. Okay? This is a somewhat standard thing. So I always get a gradient term. I can always get... Uh, pair up my gamma matrices in pairs and my sigma matrices in pairs, do the traces, and I get left with a gradient term in this order parameter field n. So that will be true for virtually any coupling of a scalar to fermions. The leading term in the, large, the derivative or large mass expansion is just a gradient term. So that's completely generic. And you see it comes in with some coupling constant. Depend m here is just mu times g. So m would vanish in the symmetric phase. But in this case, there's actually another interesting operator that can arise at next at, uh, two more two powers higher in one over m squared, which is this object. This corresponds to pairing four gamma matrices together: gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma mu, gamma nu, and also pairing up the sigmas using the properties of SU2. So there's an additional term here that arises at higher order in the derivative expansion, right? And that's crucial for the physics we're going to talk about. This is the Fadiev-Skirm term. Right, not the normal O4 fatty F term, but an O3 term. Okay. So, it's e so, so certainly you start thinking about solitons and topological field configurations at the point when you see the, the, this term naturally arising in this fourth Fermi model. But it's actually easiest to make, to make an, the analysis, Jesus, uh, if I transform to some new variables U, which are just SU2 matrices from my original fields N. So I can do that, it's just a change of variables. But the mapping here is invariant under a local U1. I can take the U1s and left multiply by a U1 phase, and clearly that's an invariance of this mapping. I can, or the, the system also has an additional global SU2, which is the analog of the O3 I started with, where I write multiply by G. Right? So I can rewrite that effective action now in terms of these U variables. So it has to be gauge invariant under this abelian U1. So it has to look like DU dagger DU. That's the gradient term. But then I can write down an analog of this four, this four derivative term, and it's just the Maxwell term. So I can write a term just involving the, the eighth mu here that I introduced. Okay. So that's, you can even map n, write n directly in terms of derivatives of n if you want. Okay, but I, I won't do that now. Okay, so that's uh, just rewriting the action in terms of a more convenient set of variables. If I'm looking for topological defects, this term is a problem because it diverges quadratically with the system volume. So the only way to get finite action configurations is to set that to zero at large r. If I do that, it determines the a mu for you. If you plug that back into the Maxwell term, you can rewrite it this way. Right. So you remember it's an SU2 matrix, so I can write it in this form, where the sum of the alphas squared has to be one. All right. So that's just generically the case. But of course, one natural way to find in a solution here where the sum of the alphas are all one, squared or one, is to take alpha to be the space-time coordinate in four dimensions over r. 
So I can construct like a hedgehog-like solution this way. Now, ordinarily, this would be a hedgehog because it would parameterize a mapping from the group manifold U into S3, the boundary of the system of this four-dimensional system. That would be an S3 to S3 mapping. But remember, U is not the physical target space. It's only the target space up to this uh, U1 gauge transformation. So in fact, it's a, it has an S2 mapping. So what we're really looking at is the so-called Hopf map, which maps you from the physical boundary 3 into S2. So most of these sphere mappings are Z2 or trivial when the two spheres don't match. The Hopf map is the one example where I can map non-trivially between two different spheres and get Z, the set of integers. So there's a natural way to build Hopf defects into this system, uh, which built out of this auxiliary field. Okay, so what are the role of these defects? By the way, you can get the topological charge just from integrating FF dual. Well, this is the abelian uh, thing. This is built, remember, out of the, the use. Well, the action, of course, you can see very, it's obvious, there's four derivatives here and integration d4x. So this thing is log divergent in the volume. So a single defect of the kind I've talked about will diverge logarithmically and be completely suppressed in the infinite volume limit. But if you, that should make you think about the two-dimensional XY model because there's an analogous statement you can make there. A single vortex in the 2D XY model also has a log divergent action. And what happens in the XY model is you end up um, binding pairs of vortices and anti-vortices together in order to get to a finite action configuration. All right? And in fact, those things are then logarithmically bound together. That's what happens. So you can conjecture that something similar might happen here. Pairs of hop or anti-hop defects can bind together in pairs. Presumably at small g, just into the broken phase, they, can pl they play no dynamical role. They're bound tightly together, just like in the XY model. But if I go take g large enough, then they should populate the vacuum. Okay? So that would be the interpretation of the fourth fermion phase as a condensation of these uh, topological defects. If you want to know when they will, that, tr when they will, that transition to a, a, condens a condensed phase will occur, you, again, can follow the XY model argument and just compare the entropy, which goes logarithmically in the volume, of a single defect with this logarithmic action for the defect. And that will give you some critical coupling, which depends on integrations that I'm not doing here. In the, the, the explicit co coefficient B here, for example. All right, um, that's interesting. But what's even more interesting is if I compute the propagator of the fermions in one of these, in the background of one of these defects, I can do that calculation, it's just the inverse of the operator. I get this general structure here. When I trick, P actually vanishes when you plug in the, 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 um, the uh, um, asymptotic behavior of the defect. So away from the cent well, a long way from the core of the defect, P equals zero, it just follows from that formula. When you do the trace here, this time drops out, and you get f find a funny-looking propagator. It has poles at m, this parameter m, so it looks like it's a massive fermion, but the structure of the top is not what you would get by normally inverting a massive fermion. There's no mass term left on the top. So it's symmetric, it violates no symmetries, but nevertheless has poles corresponding to m. So it's, by the way, this, this type of propagator has been advocated in the condensed matter literature, as far as I know, without any rigorous reasoning before. So this is the first time this structure has been actually pulled out of the mathematics directly, at least as, that I'm aware of. It also arises when you do staggered, when you do staggered quark perturbation theory, you see a very similar lattice version of this, actually. So it's kind of cute, it comes out here. So you can have massive fermions without breaking symmetries, um, as they propagate in this background, if you want. So what happens, to the, what do I expect for the phase structure? Um, as g is increased from zero, you might expect three phases. First of all, there's going to be a massless phase with 16 Majorana fermions. As I started with four and I took four copies, so I get 16. 16 is a magic number of fermions, again, according to Kitaev. Um, various interesting things can happen. So it has a trivial IR fixed point. We expect all the symmetries are completely restored and manifest. Then, following the usual NGL scenario that I sketched initially, I expect an intermediate phase with broken SO4 symmetry. So it condenses a fermion bilinear. The fermion mass is then determined by the bilinear condensate. It's a conventional scenario. So in generically, you expect that to occur, and that's what actually is seen in the numerics. There's a very narrow broken phase, which is inside of that peak I showed you, essentially, um, where this essentially occurs. Um, but then if I keep cranking up G, I expect at some point 
a full fermion condensate to arise, and in this auxiliary field picture, that's going to correspond to the proliferation of topological defects. Fermions now acquire masses by propagating in this funny background, and the infrared behavior of the system depends a lot on what happens at the phase, the second phase transition. If it's first order, then again, this still can be made continuous, or if it is continuous, then it becomes very interesting. So let me just show you, sketch how this really looks. So what I've said so far sounds like the XY model, sounds like BKT, but of course, two more minutes, so I'll, I'll be done. I have two more slides. Um, but it, it's not really because I'm going from a broken phase to a symmetric phase at strong coupling. What I'd like to go to is for, to go directly from symmetric to symmetric, right? Then I know the transition is likely continuous and like XY. There's a way in which you can do that. I have this gradient term in the action. I can imagine plugging in, moving away from a full Fermi interaction to a true Higgs-Yukawa model by putting in a gradient term like that too. And let me tune its coefficient so the net gradient term is zero. So that, okay, so I have a bare gradient term coming just from the, my initial action and then the term induced by the fermions. In that case, I would, all the physics is determined by the quartic action. If I parameterize u as e to the i theta, theta a, sigma a, tau a it should be really, I can work out this, and it's just a quartic operator where this is the Laplacian squared. Okay? If I compute, say, the expectation value of one of my uh, spins in this background, one of my end fields, it turns out this is quadratic in theta 3. I don't have time to fill that up, but it's very obvious if you just power expand it. And because it's, this action is also quadratic in theta 3, it can exponentiate the correlator. This is just the propagator for a quartic interaction in four dimensions, so it's logarithmic, just like the XY model and I find a power law decay of the magnetization. So this is very similar to what happens in the XY model case. And in this case, you've you might be able to convince yourself that this thing is, there is, you've removed the broken phase because it basically the, this thing decays like a power of the system volume where the power depends on this parameter M. So the broken phase is removed. At that point, you really expect that the condensation of these bound sets of vortices, of uh, bound defects, will look very similar to the BKT analysis in two dimensions, all right? And that would mean that the transition was continuous, presumably, between them. So you'd be going from symmetric massless to symmetric massive through a continuous BKT-like transition. So, so let me summarize. I introduced this model based on Kähler Dirac fermions that discretizes to these staggered four fermion models that have been set recently. Once this interaction is strong enough, I expect I can have topological field configurations in principle play a role. They have to occur in pairs because I need to have finite action. Fermions nevertheless propagating in that background pick up a mass, but I don't need any symmetry breaking to generate that mass. It's entirely a function of uh, the propagation in these non-trivial vacuum states. Um, I've argued that if I tune out the leading term in the effective action by moving to a more general Higgs-Yukawa model and then tuning in that additional coupling, I should be able to remove the symmetry broken intermediate phase. Numerically, it's already extremely narrow. In G, it's less than 0.1, right? So it's a very narrow phase. It's hard to see, in fact, numerically. Um, so the argument is if you have a small gradient term, you might be able to get rid of it completely. And that's something we're actually looking at numerically at this point. Um, so I, by, by the way, this work was done with my student, Newman Bach, who's also running some of those simulations. Um, anyway, in that case, you'd expect BKT to be somehow relevant. The question is, what is this continuum theory, if there is one there? Is it Lorentz invariant? Likely not. The symmetries I preserve at strong coupling are these twisted symmetries. So that might be the rub in the end, that this theory perhaps doesn't have a conventional interpretation in terms of a Lorentz invariant quantum field theory, but something more exotic. Something in which the Kähler Dirac symmetry is the important symmetry, not the usual Lorentz symmetry. What else might this be good for? Well, lattice models that use carefully chosen quartic interactions to gap out fermions without breaking symmetries are very much in vogue in the condensed matter literature, going back to Kateyev's early papers. They're related to SPT phases and topological insulators and things like that. So there's some connection there to the CN um, literature. And actually, in lattice gauge theory, there was an old proposal by Acton and Preskill many years ago, 86, that if you could, you could use quartic interactions carefully chosen to gap out doubler or mirror states uh, and a would-be uh, la chiral lattice gauge theory. You start off with a chiral lattice gauge theory, uh, a chiral theory in the continuum. You go to naive fermions and replace derivatives by different operators. You have all these doublers which ruin everything, 
then if you could somehow gap the double estates out, um, you could try to leave, and by some tuning, a light fermion in the continuum limit, light vial fermion. Um, in the old days, this failed as a proposal, primarily because there was always this intermediate phase where the symmetry broke spontaneously. All right? So what I'm arguing is that in this model, it might be possible to evade those old uh, numerical results, the, and a large n results, which, which basically prohibit this proposal from working. Uh, and you could ask, well, maybe there's some way to make this work now. Um, caution here, you can't just take what I just told you as a four fermion interaction and just replace staggered fermions with vial fermions or naive vial fermions. Actually, there's two epsilon symbols contracting the alpha, beta, gamma, data missing here. You can just show that that interaction vanishes for vial fermions. Okay, so you can't do anything really simple here. It's not at all clear how you generalize this to just to, to vial fermions. It seems to be tied to these Kähler Dirac fermions or to staggered fermions much more strongly than to ordinary vial fermions. So I don't put much hope in that, actually. Um, anyway, um, so that's it, I think. Thanks. Sorry. So, um, as you mentioned, I mean, this, if this worked, it would be sort of the holy grail for chiral gauge theories. Uh, <clears throat> one problem, it, that conceptual problem is uh, showing that it could work for an anomaly-free representation, yeah. but not for an anomalous one. So one thing that would be sort of interesting in your model is to look at um, subgroups of the global symmetries and ask whether if you gauged it weakly, whether your theory could be consistent with the Toft anomalies if you assumed Lorentz invariance. Yeah, then, I mean, it might be okay because it's essentially a bunch of vector fermions in the end, if, in the Kähler Dirac prescription, not the vial version, right? I, I mean, it could be that you'll find that all the global symmetries are naturally right. anomaly free and there's no problem. But if you found that, that your model, you would have a choice of weakly gauging an anomalous right. or an anomaly free theory, then right. it might be hard to picture how this phase could exist. I mean, as far as I know, there's no restriction in the original model to Anomaly free representations, is there? So the original model specifically was an anomaly free SU5 representation. No, they chose that, but what forced them to have that? They, um, there's a mystical belief that uh, if you have anomaly cancellation, will be pot, this phase might exist, but if you don't, it won't. So it was just a hope. That they... Right, it's a hope. But if you have a model where you believe a phase exists, it's worth checking whether it forces you to only have anomaly free representations of the global symmetries or whether. There's a contradiction there. Yeah. I mean, there's no, it's possible you can try to play this game somehow in a domain wall fermion setup too, and sort of have the best of both worlds. I don't know. This uh, is again about the phase transition, uh, which you mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Now, uh, the last years we have done lots of simulation, many groups on four Fermi theories, as you know, and the hardest part at the end of the day was to localize the lattice artifact phase. So there's, for all these models, there's a phase transition to a lattice artifact phase, uh -huh. which is characterized by the Pauli blocking of the fermions on the lattice. Right. So there's an observable in the dual formulation which you can measure, and then you see you always run into this blocking phase. Right, right. So, uh, I, I agree, the four Fermi phase is not particularly exotic. It's been seen many, many times before. Yeah. It's rather Did you check, this you check whether this is now a lattice artifact phase or not? I mean, well, that's uh, the whole issue. I mean, the, yeah. you, if there's a continuous transition separating this from a, a, a massless phase, it, it isn't a lattice artifact. It, there's something interesting happening. Yeah. Most, almost all the lattice models have been looked at, mm -hmm. they always suffer from the fact that, uh, that it basically is separate by first order transitions, or it's, there's this intermediate broken phase, and so it's always kind of an exotic but uninteresting artifact from the continuum perspective. I mean, this, uh, this model may be the same ultimately, mm -hmm. but there's a little bit more hope here just because of the Structure, and it's clearly not generic, it depends on the symmetry. Well, structure's okay. nice. Any other questions? 